lot of circle security. There's a lot of stuff online. Um, obviously, I've trained a lot in this, but you can get a lot of handouts. Um, this is for babies, but there's a, an older child one as well. And it's something that women understand. They've got little videos you can use with your patients um, as well. That's just kind of really sensible. You don't have to have high reflective functioning to make sense of it. Um, so pretty much all your patients are going to be able to use this. And it's very much about not about accusing mum of being a bad mum. It's about what does your reading your baby's cues. Um, and so it's, it's a very patient friendly um, thing. Um, so overall messages are that um, perinatal illness is common um, and it can be serious, serious, but particularly it can be serious not just for the woman but for all the generations that come. Um, and at this stage, er the earliest possible identification, um, ideally if you can do preconceptual, fantastic. Um, and Cindy Lee Dennis in um, Canada has this huge project across four countries looking at that. But the one place we can get in really early is in antenatal care because pretty much every woman in Australia has antenatal care. So that's the clear kind of point of entry. Um, and if not then, then early postnatal. Um, and, and then remember that it's not just about the mum, but about the whole family and the child. Um, and watch this space uh, for what's happening. As I said, Jayshree may tell you a bit more about some of those biological sort of avenues. And Catherine's here in the, the audience to ask about her very exciting local stuff that we're, we're, we're here doing. Um, helping mothers helps babies. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got mastery of the questions, so uh, here we are. Maternal steroids. Ooh, an interesting one. Probably not except in maybe a very, very small percentage of um, uh, per se uh, sensitive people. Bromocryptine um, is not going to, which is given to stop lactation. It doesn't affect many people, but there's a very small percentage that it is going to make a lot worse. Um, and it's hard to know exactly um, which ones they are going to be. Um, I'd be sort of watching carefully for anyone that had a history of reacting to the pill, for instance, or any previous um, interventions, but, but probably not. I mean, probably yes, but we're not going to be able to pick which ones, and it's only a very small number. Um, specific clinical time messages treatment. Um, as I said, a lot of the, the research findings are, are kind of watch this space, um, apart from the sort of the more don't forget about the baby. Um, I'd be really watching those with childhood trauma histories and be doing preventative work with them, really talking about attachment. And as psychiatrists, a lot of your patients are going to, if not all, are going to have trauma histories. It doesn't necessarily need to be sort of psychotherapy per se, um, but it needs to, to have some supportive psychotherapy, I guess, component in it. And tre treating postnatal depression, a lot of mothers are hesitant about mm. antidepressants uh, yeah. if they have got a severe enough depression that you mm. think they're warranted, worried about lactation, worried about that. Any mm. advice, suggestions, comments? Um, look, I think that we still very clearly we want to treat the depression and if I, I tell, I do a lot of advice on this um, and weighing it up, there's more evidence that an untreated depression is at risk to the baby um, than virtually any of the medications with um, in lactation the exception of lithium and clozapine um, and in pregnancy probably, oh well, obviously epilim, um, possibly to some degree lamotrigine, um, lithium has some risks um, and I'd avoid clozapine there as well. But all of the others, uh, particularly if it's just one medication and average doses, um, the risks of untre not treating higher hmm. than, than treating. Um, what's the reason for different response, stress induced? What was the reason? Um, well, this is the the, the stre different res stress responses is really going back to the, the probably the placental changes. Um, so this these are the babies that have been exposed to mum's stress day in day out, rather than just a, a focused stress test. Um, so that the placenta has actually altered enzymes in the placenta are altered. Um, now, why the evolutionary theory is to get rid of the 
the boys that aren't super boys um, and help the, the girls adapt to this stressful new, envi new environment. I mean, in, in theory, it doesn't work in practice, but in theory, the babies um, of stressed mums, say in war-torn um, areas, might react a bit faster um, to the, the bomb dropping near them or something. Um, but there is some evolutionary theory around it, but the actual mechanism is probably through, uh, well, certainly the placenta, but also these immune markers um, and microbiota. Um, it's, the name of the Kelly Lane program is Exposed. Um, there's three, it's, a, it's like it's a bit over sensationalised, like all journalists kind of tend, tend towards, but there's some really interesting um, sort of comments on it uh, about the, um, the law um, and how the law played her and did deals so that witnesses that should have been shown weren't. Um, and a psychiatrist never saw her. Um, I was the first psychiatrist to actually see her and she's been in jail for like seven years. Um, the psychiatrist that looked at her notes um, and gave a comment said he thought she was a psychopathic narcissistic personality disorder. And look on the notes, I don't blame him for saying that. Um, I don't think that was an incorrect thing to say on notes. But having met her, I disagree. I think she's got narcissistic traits, but I don't think she has, she doesn't qualify for a personality disorder. Um, the antidepressants and autism are kind of interesting. Um, I'm still, <laughs> If you look at the data, it's not convincing, and mostly they say no, that it's not. But I'd still be really, really anxious about high doses um, of antidepressants. Um, and some of the, the research shows that depression and autism tend to go in the same family. So, of course, therefore, women with depression are more likely to be on antidepressants, but they also have the family history of autism. So that's kind of hard to, well, it can be um, uh, allowed for in statistically, and that mostly says there isn't a link. Um, but as I said, high, we don't have good data, they're not randomised, and I'd still be very anxious in some of those high dose medications. And talking high dose, are you talking mm. more about the, the transfer through breast milk? No, no, in utero. In, in utero. utero. In utero. Not, not, not so it's much in breast milk, yeah. Right. Um, mostly babies can tolerate that pretty well, with the yeah. possible exception of Effexor, because that has a higher level of going through anyway. So just keep a closer eye on your Effexor babies if um, mum is breastfeeding. No. Um, don't think so. Um, don't think there's any evidence that probiotics help at this stage. Um, but uh, maybe Michael Burke will t talk about that. Uh, now should I be... I keep going to the top one. Is that yes, what I should be doing? Right, yes. Right, um, oh, Absolutely, um, I think we all should should have mentalisation based treatments. I, I don't think it should be a treatment. I should be something we all encourage to do at school, maybe, um, because it's and it's, it's a huge part of what you need to do in the attachment based sort of work that I do is helping them see the world from the baby's point of view. When I'm doing parenting assessments, that's really what I'm assessing is their capacity to do that or learn that. And if you look at Arietta Slade's work um, on really high risk mums, the ones who had the lowest reflective functioning were the ones that actually did the biggest um, shift um, so they could learn. Uh, it took time and a lot of effort, weekly for quite some time with nurse therapists, but they did improve. Um, the, the baby love I don't think is running anymore since I stopped doing it, um, uh, sadly. So now I've got a few individual therapists. And baby love was our name for the Circle of Security program because we weren't allowed to use Circle of Security because I hadn't done all their supervision. I'd done their exams but hadn't done their supervision, so we just called it something different. Um, We've only got some very basic results um, and certainly showed the women loved it. Um, and we haven't done any follow-ups about attachment though, which is what you really need. Now, on the other hand, someone else is doing those. Um, Rebecca Ray did a poster uh, um, of some of that. Um, and there's also, I think, Carolyn Zanetti might have even done some work looking at the, the attachment. Again, not enough information to show that you really can change attachment. Strong suggestion. Um, I'd like more robust results, but there are people out there doing it. Um, I just haven't seen those results. Um, yes, that's the first one. Um, so high risk of ADHD. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the disorganised attachment has the highest risk of everything. Um, 
we don't exactly know all of the mechanisms, but um, a lot of this is what I've been talking about. And there is a, as I said, little boys react differently right back from the placenta. We know that little boys have different reactions, uh, different um, mechanisms going on. And of course, they're the ones that are mostly being diagnosed with the ADHD. Um, so the actual attachment process um, is, I mean, what, what a secure attachment is about saying, my mum is there for me and I'm worth it. Mm -hmm. And if you can't learn that in the first year of life, then you have to learn a way of, of getting by in your relationships. Um, and that makes you anxious, not knowing that someone is there for you and in every relationship you ever have, that's what you go into um, with a, an insecure attachment. It's worse if you've got a disorganised attachment. So. You start a little boy or a little girl for that matter at school, what happens to them is that you're throwing a whole lot of attachments at them. You're throwing a teacher at them who's not their mum and has 20 other kids that they've got to share her with and all these kids they've got to interact with. And boys tend to socialise later than girls anyway. So there's a whole lot of things happening here and these are highly at risk kids. Um, I think there is some work on prem babies um, with attachment. Um, there are certainly some issues for the mums, the higher rates of anxiety in particular, um, not so much depression, but certainly anxiety. And you could understand why, particularly if their babies have been in um, nurseries with things attached for months. Um, so, uh, but I'm not exactly sure of sort of what 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 this what that shows so I can't really comment more on that. So what are the the issue of physical engagement because the child is really often dislocated yeah. from the crib. Yep. A whole lot of uh, other supports for the for the baby, especially mm -hmm. the very very young, very premature babies. Yeah. Well, but, mothers yeah. Can help to yeah, the help kangaroo them. care has been shown to be really, really um, positive with regards to that, whether it's the mother doing it or... Um, so that actual physical touch is usually important and that can be done. Mm. You're, you're totally right. So it's um, it's dealing with mum's anxiety in those pregnant... Uh, sorry, in those prem babies um, and then managing it as best you can within the limitations of what the baby is attached to. Um, so we still have three public mother baby units here in Victoria, but we've also got two, pr two oh sorry, that's in Melbourne, but then we've also got the Ballarat, um, Bendigo and one in Terrelgan, Um and they are all up and running. I'm about to have a meeting tomorrow night with all of those groups, so I'll, because last I heard the Ballarat one was kind of a five day one and was only taking very low risk group, um, but the others theoretically can take, um, you know, cases of, um, you know, postpartum psychosis right through. There is a bit of a differing philosophy. Um, the Austin unit um, does a lot of protective services work, um, partly because of my philosophy, that this is the hard end stuff and that's what we are meant to be doing. That's why I'm a psychiatrist. Um, yes, they have to have a mental health history, but to me that's a job um, that is our job and not to be flicked over to someone else. And Queen Elizabeth, centre who does a lot of parenting assessments for DHS is oh, doesn't have enough beds anyway, but can't cope with a whiff of anything, um, like with any whiff of violence, of borderline personality disorder, of anything that's slightly difficult, they just won't touch them. Um, so protective services um, really need someone to be able to kind of really assess these mums. And from our point of view, I want to give the mums and dads the best possible chance. Um, just before the next one, I, yep. I'll, I'll just say a point about in private, for those mothers who are very ill uh, with psychosis or very severe depressions who are s severely limited in their capacity to look after their baby, but you still would not like some engagement as much as you can, in private it is financially impossible because you really have got to have nursing staff to care for the babe and assist with the babe while supporting the babe with a very ill mother. And unfortunately, the private sector is now under the current funding arrangements only funded for a single patient and there is no, there is no ability for the mother and the babe to both be adequately funded. So unfortunately, in private at the moment, mother-baby units for a bit of sleep difficulties, if mum's doing well, that's easy for low impact sort of stuff. But in terms of the severely ill mother and uh, looking after vulnerable and at-risk children, that's not available because of the current funding arrangements. 
Hopefully that may change in the future. Right now, uh, not. Yeah. And I to totally agree, but that reminded me that the, the hot off the press, and this was titled Hot Topics, is I got an email from Petra, who's our new CEO at North Park, and she's expanding the mother baby unit there. Um, so it's kind of gone through cycles because it was quite big and then it got quite small for that very reason. I'm not sure what the expansion actually means yet because the funding hasn't changed magically. Um, so... Yeah, and it probably is more about than the next level up, not the really severely unwell mums. Relapse. Um, and relapse, look, past history is, is still your, your most, you know, thing I would really stick with. And I follow these... Um, oh, sorry, in, in subsequent pregnancies, yeah, I'm answering the right question. Um, and I'd certainly be following these people through and putting in as much supports. Um, if they've got a history of postpartum psychosis, I mean, I tried to look at this... Um, it was really interesting. Um, I was just doing a sort of naturalistic study and I actually had a really low rate of relapses, um, which was really annoying for my study, but really great for the women. And that's because you guys are all treating them really well and what you were doing is not letting them have their, do their night feeds. So um, the thing you want for the, for the more severe end is to really look at sleep deprivation and manage that through late pregnancy um, and the early postpartum. Um, but for the, the straight depressions, um, support, 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 um, and just close monitoring um, past history is the best predictor. And thank you very much. A fantastic talk and very, very helpful.